Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. In this video I'm going to be talking about sand dunes and the sand dune community here at Berghead and basically talking about how it transitions from just sand to more complex plant life and then eventually forested woodland in this area. So I've taken you down now and this is a part of North Scotland. We've got Berghead town over there. Behind you is Colburn Sands which is a very large famous sand dune complex which is tamed by the, tamed by the local foresters here in the 1930s. So this here is a good example of an embryo dune. So it's the very first dune that forms as part of the sand dune succession. So the wind blows up a lot of sand. It then forms a very small lump here where the sand has collected against maybe some stones or some dead vegetation. It then keeps building up against itself. And the first plants to germinate and grow here are the marum grasses. So we have marum grass here. You can see there's only a few of them. They're very young, they're new shoots. These are probably grown vegetatively by sending runners down from the upper dunes down to this section. Some of them could be self-seeded, but, but it's mainly by runners that the marum grass normally spreads. As you can see, they're quite young. They haven't colonized much of it, and that's because it's constantly being covered up by sand, and this is just a very young dune. The, the um, embryo dunes here at the front don't normally live very long. They're normally only maybe there for a year or two. You can see down here, that there's a nice runner. So the marum grass is very well suited to the, the sand or sandy dune conditions and that's because the, the roots they spread out a long way and then they send up these little new plants so that if there's any so if they're very quick they can quickly colonize any sort of shifting sands. So if there's a new area that's got sand in it they, they'll push the runners out so you can hear here this one has been pushed out. Now if sand was to wash up into this area this would then have somewhere to put its roots in and this would grow a new plant. When this grows large enough, it'll then send another runner out trying to find new areas. That works really well in a situation like this where the sand shift around a lot. Because if the mother plant is killed, it's got so many other little baby plants around it that they will continue. So if this embryo dune here gets washed away, there's several other ones further along the coast. There's a lot more mountain grass roots which will survive. And then if this dune reappears again, they can put their roots back in and it will grow. So these help also build the sand dunes as well. The mountain grasses are great for that. They slow down the wind, and when the wind is slowed down, it can't carry as much sand. So any sand that is being carried by the wind is then deposited around this. The sand is then trapped around here, and even if you have strong winds, the wind can't blow the sand away because these are protecting it. Also the roots, they have very long runners and roots going through, and those roots will help stabilize the sand and stop it from moving around. So it's no longer like a coastal environment like this, it starts to become a sand dune environment. So what happens is as this builds you then get the four dunes and then the, then the main dunes as well, often called yellow dunes, and that's what we have up here. These are starting to build up now. You can see it's always in a constant flux of being washed away and built up. You can see some but where it's bits behind me where it's been washed away, and other bits here where it's currently building up, and you've got loads of little mound grass shoots starting to grow up and colonize the area. The mound grass, I say, is very well suited. It's a very salty environment here. The storms aren't huge in this part of the beach, which is why you've got the mound grass right at the front, but you still get a lot of salt spray, and all the sand is originally from the sea, so there's a lot of salt in this environment, but the mound grass is really good at handling the salt, and it has special leaves here. So if I take a leaf, I can show you exactly how the leaf can help uh, survive in this position, in this environment. So at the moment, the leaf is flat, and that is because there must be enough water in the environment. But mound grasses here have a very unique habit that they can help conserve water if it is too dry. And that is the leaf will curl up like this. And what happens when it's curled up is it means that it doesn't have a bigger surface area. So it can half its surface area and that way lose a lot less moisture. Now this one doesn't want to curl up at the moment because it's got plenty of water in it. But if it was in a dry location, this would curl up and that curve right there would help prevent any moisture loss. So as I say, this is the mound grass. This is probably the, the most important species that you'll find here on the dunes and any of the dunes in, in, in many coastal areas all around the world. It's normally the mound grasses which help firm down the dunes. And that allows other plants to then grow. And then as the mound grass dies off, it's a lot of the old leaves will die. You can see there's some old leaves here. As they die off, they rot away, provide humus and organic matter for the soil, which in turn provides more nutrients and water retention, which allows other more complex plant forms to grow. So I'm going to take you now further up the sand dunes and show you what other plants are well suited to this coastal environment. So I've taken you now to an area where there's a lot of sea buckthorn. Now sea buckthorn is a really good coastal plant 
You'll see it in quite a few areas dotted around on coastal sand dunes around Scotland. And interestingly enough, sea buckthorn, although it's called sea buckthorn and you see it at the coast all around the UK, it's not specifically a coastal plant. In fact, it has a massive distribution around the world. It's mainly actually in China and the, the parts of the Middle East and, and parts of the Mediterranean as well, and not actually where next to the sea. Now, the reason it does so well next to the sea here in, in the northern, right up here in North Scotland, is because the other places it grows is actually a desert. And the desert environment is surprisingly similar to this one here in the sand dunes. That's because in the sand dunes here, it's very dry, that any water that does come from the rain drains straight through the soil. The soil is also very poor, there's no organic matter. As you can see down here, it's just sand, there's nothing else. Especially down here, this part of the, um, the sand dune, it's just sand and nothing else. There's no organic matter. So I'll just show you a close up now. And what this sea buckthorn is growing in is almost 100% sand. You can see there are a few small pieces of rotting plant material, but basically it's growing in sand and nothing else. So there's very little nutrients, very little organic matter, so there's no water retention really, any water goes through and there's, there's no food for it really. So the reason it does so well in this environment is because in, its, uh, in the other environments it lives in the deserts, there's very little water and same here, what it has to do is put its roots very deep. And so it has very deep roots. When it's a young plant it actually struggles quite a lot to get established. But once it is established it can spread really well and the roots go several meters into the ground so they can search out, find any water. And a lot of these environments, because it's next to the sea, there's a lot of groundwater just about, just down by the sea level. So if this is up at the top of the sand zoom, it can grow about four meters down and find water in, in the groundwater and then it gets all the water it needs. You can see up here, it's formed pretty much an impenetrable fortress of, of stems and thorns. It's quite a prickly plant as well. And that helps to stabilize the sand zoom. So that helps even more than the mound grass. The mound grass is only a grass, it only grows about a two or three foot at most. Whereas the sea buckthorn here can grow two or three meters. At this location, it's right on the sea edge, so it's not very tall. The wind keeps battering it, keeping it low. But it's very good at tolerating salt, and any salt spray doesn't normally kill off the shoots and the branches. And I'll show you this one down here, actually. So this one right here is buffeted by the sea. It's right next to the sea. The, the, as you can see, there's actually um, bits of seaweed here. So the sea does wash up here. And yet the sea buckthorn is fine. Even the, the stems right on the edge, despite being after a winter of storms and salt spray, there's still fresh growth and leaves there. Most plants that you'll find in the front here will be killed off by the salt. But as you can see from the sea buckthorn, it hasn't got any problems at all. It's doing quite well. So that's the sea buckthorn. It's a very important crop, actually. It's got lovely bright orange berries and it's, um, it's farmed in quite a few countries. China is the biggest producer of sea buckthorn berries. They're actually higher in vitamin C than even um, oranges and lemons. So they're a very good health crop. And if it wasn't for the really sour kind of taste that they have, they might be more popular. So finally, the last thing that really helps the sea buckthorn survive in this environment is it's actually nitrogen fixing. Now it doesn't fix nitrogen the same way that legumes they fix nitrogen like brooms and the bean family. Um, but it still uses bacteria that are in, in its roots and the bacteria can fix the nitrogen out of the air and turn it into a type of nitrogen that the plant can utilize. So most plants can't do that. There's only a few, like I said, the legumes can do it. Most plants, if there isn't nitrogen in the soil, they just have to suffer and try and get as much from the soil as they can. But this can create its own nitrogen straight from thin air and that it helps in this environment because there's, no, there's almost no nitrogen in this sand, there's very little nutrients. So the nitrogen is very soluble compared with potassium and phosphorus. So the other minerals stay in the soil a bit better, but the nitrogen is the one that really gets washed out by any heavy rains, which is why it's really important that this can produce its own nitrogen. The other, chemi the other chemicals that it uses and nutrients in the soil, there's just about enough of them that it can survive. It doesn't have to produce its own. But that's the sea buckthorn. As I say, a very good plant for coastal environments, one of the toughest plants. Even though it's down here at the sea, it can even survive hard frosts. I think minus 40, minus 50 in wintertime it can survive and it can survive extreme heat as well, up to over 40 degrees and that's because, as I say, it can grow right inland in areas such as China and almost as far as Mongolia. So I'm taking you now to this part of the sand dune to show you what happens when the sea washes it away and also the roots of the mound grasses. So if you look at the top here, you can see a lot of the roots from the mound grasses, they come down at least a meter into the sand and they're very long roots and this really helps to stabilize the sand dunes. 
So this ties it all together and adds a lot of stability. And you can also see a lot of darker bands starting to form in the higher up sections of the sand. And this is where the mound roots are starting to rot away as they get old and they're replaced with new ones. And there's a bit of humus starting to build up in the sand dunes. It's that humus which contains the nutrients here in the sand and also holds a lot of the moisture that will help other plants to grow further. So as I say, the sand dunes here are in a constant flux of chains. Sometimes they're building up higher, sometimes they're getting washed away. This is a section that's been heavily washed away at the moment. It's probably lost three or four meters in the last year or two. As you can see, it's about three or four meter high cliff now of sand. And as I say, you can see all the runners there really helping to hold the sand together. So I've taken you now to another part of the, the sand dunes here. As you can see, there's a lot of roots coming down on all areas, and this is the Corsican pine. So the Corsican pine is very good for a coastal environment. As you can see up here, they're right on the edge of the sand dunes. They can, they're one of the toughest pines when it comes to surviving at the seafront. So these have been specifically planted here to protect the sea and protect the sand dunes from the sea so that when there's storms, it doesn't blow the sand around because there's been big problems here in the past and the, big, the sand dune formation here are very similar to the famous ones at Colburn Sands and they used to swallow up whole villages and towns back in the past. So what they've done, they planted there with a lot of trees to help stabilise the dunes and that's really worked quite well here. Now all this dune environment is just a woodland instead of a shifting sand. So no, people no longer have to worry about their houses or roads being covered up by sands. So this is of course in Pine as a say, very well suited. Um, Corsican pines is actually from, as the name suggests, in the Mediterranean region, but this variety actually comes from Austria, and they've chosen the Austrian variety because we're so far north here, we get harsh winters, the summers are quite cool, so this one's much more suited to this environment. So as you can see here, the roots are very long. I mean, these roots, this is a great example here, we've got a tree that's been washed away because of the, uh, the sea has washed away the sand, and it's fallen down, so the roots here are exposed, and it's a great way of me to show you what the roots are like. As you can see, they don't branch much, they're just very long, and they're very straight roots. Now this is because the sand here is so free draining that the, um, there's not much moisture and not much nutrients, so the, the tree has to put its roots really deep and far, trying to find any water it can, and this really helps to, um, to stabilize the sand dunes because as the roots go tens of meters through the sands, it helps to stabilize it. And I'll just show you a piece over here, which is an exceptionally large piece of uh, Corsican pine root. So you can see this one here. It's come all the way from that tree up there. It's then self-rooted again, and we've got more roots coming out down here. You can see it's that, that's solid, and there's some more roots here. You can really see the length of it, and that's quite tight, that one, because it's still alive, that part of the tree, even though it's fallen down. So that's the Corsican pine. As I say, this has been eroded by big storms, so it's a great example to show you how the roots look here right at the sand dunes edge. And you can imagine underground, further back in the forest, these roots are going possibly as deep as 10 meters and as far as 10 meters in some areas, holding together the sand and trying to get any nutrients that they can. So I've taken you now to the very top of the, the front dunes here. This is where the mountain grass transitions into forest. So as you can see, just behind me is the sea. It's a very windswept location. We're probably about five or six meters above sea level here. The sand is really pushed up high with the wind and form these really tall dunes. So just to the side here is where the first plantations of forest have been planted. This is Corsican pine again. You can see here behind me that it's been very swept by the wind. You can see that how it's been pushed over. It's tried to grow it up, but the wind just forces it back again. So these trees take the full force of the wind. You can see a lot of the, the top branches have died off because the salt has been so extreme. Even though these are Corsican pines, which can survive some very salty environments, even for this, it's too much for them. But these are actually doing a very important job, these trees. These trees are protecting the trees further back from them. And because they're protecting the ones further back, they can grow a few centimeters taller, and so far and so forth. So 10 meters back, you've got a lot more height to the trees because they're protected from these front trees here. So as you go back into the sand dunes, you get what they call a, a dune slack, which is where the, the soil drops right down and it goes almost as low as the sea level. So I'll go down there now so you can see how far down it is. And this gives some great protected environment. You've got here a flowering current, which is surviving quite well. Where I am here, there's absolutely no wind. If I was to put my head up to about the height of my hand right now, it'll be really windy. And in fact, if I go up, you'll probably see in my hair just how windy it is. So from here, there's no wind. And then as they come up, you can see there's quite a lot of wind now blowing in my hair because it's just that little space 
all it takes is, is a few feet and you've got a huge amount of protection because of the sand dunes and also because of the trees. So I'll come down here now and you can see that right down here it's a very sheltered environment. You can probably hear it hopefully in the microphone that you can't hear any sea noises anymore. And it comes right down into a very shaded environment protected from the elements and this provides a new habitat for any plants and animals which are going to grow here. So I've come down now out of the coastal environment. You can see just behind me are the sand dunes and where, where you're standing now with the camera is only a few meters away from the sea really, maybe 10 meters, something like that. And you can see how sheltered it is here just with that wall of sand and, and um, grasses and trees. There's just no wind getting down here. So there's a bit of wind coming through this gap. But as I come further down, you can see the, the sand disappears. There's a lot of grasses and there's even wood sedges here. The wood sedge is a very common woodland plant that does well in shady areas. Where it's actually quite, um, and it needs quite a bit more moisture than a lot of the, the, the mound grasses. So that's a good indication that there's more moisture here. As we come down to the sand slack, because it's so low down, the water table is a lot higher, especially as some of these sand, sand slacks about sea level height. The ones that are sea level height will actually have ponds, so you can get quite a lot of aquatic life, even though the rest of the area is just a few meters higher up. It's more like a desert environment, so that provides a really big wide range of environments in a small area. So as I said, these were, this was forested probably in the 1930s. These trees at the front here, you can see they're not very big. These are in a bad environment because they're right next to the sea, they've been battered by the wind and they haven't grown very big. Later on in the forest, I'll show you somewhere where there's some really large trees and they've grown a lot better. So here you can see there's lots of grasses starting to grow. There's also a load of pine needles on the floor. There's a good litter, a lot of litter building up. As this rots down, it provides a lot of organic matter. But you can still see here, it's very sandy, but the sand is now changed. It's now it's slightly darker in color and there's a lot more organic matter. So you can see there's a lot more dark patches here, the little pieces there of organic matter, and it's slowly getting more like soil. But even on this transition, because this forest has only been planted about in the 1930s, even when I get back to the back areas where there's a lot more plants, and a lot more established areas of, of, with better soil, it's still, it still won't look like topsoil, it'll still, will still look pretty much like sand, because say this has only had about 80 years or so to, to really develop the soils. So you can see behind me, this was all sand dunes originally. There's a lot of um, undulation. There's a big sand dune up here. And there's a lot of woodland plants starting to colonize this area, so it's starting to look quite nice. You've got dog, dog rose here, the native rose. So this here is actually a Catoni aster. So that's got some lovely berries. It's doing better in this, this environment. You've also got a lot of mosses here, so it's quite a damp environment. As I say, it's very sheltered from the wind and it's very shaded by the trees. But you can see there's some remnants of the sand dunes still surviving in here. And that's just up behind me where you've got an open area where some of the trees have been have blown over or maybe they had a fire break and there's not any trees. You can see there's mountain grasses again and sand dune environments. So in fact, if you, because this is so recently colonized by trees, if you were to cut all these trees down and plow the land, it would just turn back into a mass of sand dunes again. So even though we've come several meters now from the sea, the actual variety of plants here hasn't really increased a huge amount. And that's because of the Corsican pine here. Now, and also because of the soil and how poor it is and how sandy it still is in this area. So what's happening is the Corsican pine is doing moderately well. You can still see it's not huge, but it's definitely bigger than the Corsican pine that I showed you at the front down there. This is quite a high up area, so it's still very free draining. If we were in one of the dune slacks, you get a lot more vegetation, and that's because there's a lot more water, and there's also a lot more minerals and nutrients which are in that water. Whereas here, any of the minerals and nutrients get washed straight down into the groundwater. So here, the soil is still very poor, and even the organic, organic matter isn't high enough yet. It is starting to build up at this level, though. So what the Corsican pine does is it shades out. So there's quite a bit of shade, but as you can see, see there's still some light getting through. So you would think there would be some, soil, uh, some plants surviving in this location. And there is in fact some marron grass still left over from when this was a sand dune. You can see some growing here. But one of the problems that the pines cause is the amount of needles they drop. And this can cause two problems. One, it forms a very thick layer of pine needles, which is very difficult for anything to grow in. It smothers anything out. You can't see any bare soil here because there's so many. And also as they rot down, they can be quite acidic. So you can see here, it's several centimeters of pine needles, very thick. There's nothing really able to grow in that because it's just rotting pine needles. There's not much nutrients. But as I dig down, there is an organic layer and I'll show you what that looks like. I'll just dig out some. And it's, um, it's quite a good layer actually. 
uh, because it's so acidic and it's still relatively low nutrients, not a lot grows in it. You can see there the good layer of organic matter. Underneath there you can see the sand starting to appear. And the problem is because it's so um, such an, an acidic environment, and that's partly because it's sandy and also because of all the pine needles and the, and the high rainfall that we get here in Scotland. Because it's so acidic, there's not really any organisms. You can see here that it's there's no organisms breaking it down, it's not mixing it into the sand, that's causing problems so that it just stays on the top of the soil, doesn't mix with the sand and make a nice nice growing environment. So the, the high acidity, as I say, stops any microorganisms from really thriving. There'll be a few in here, but there won't be many. You won't find worms and things like that. You'll only find them in the areas that are less acidic. And that means that this just builds up, doesn't decompose, and eventually could actually start forming peat. But because it's so free draining here, it's most likely it won't form peat. But there we are, that's the organic layer. And as I say, down below, you can see here, it's still just pure sand. The, uh, the sand hasn't completely gone yet. So I've taken you now to an area to show you how well the trees do further back from the environment of the, of the sea and the spray and how well it does. So where the camera is at the moment is only about 20 meters away from the, from the sea and behind you is a load of really sickly unhealthy trees which have been struggling with the salt spray. But here is a great example of how much taller they can grow. You can see these are, these are really quite tall. These are probably getting close to 20 meters in height, these trees. And further back, there might even be some 30 to possibly 40 meters if there's a, a certain environment. So the reason these are doing so much better, there's a real good hollow here and that means that the wind can't inhibit the growth. So if you were to look from the top of the forest, you would actually think the trees are all the same height because they'll all look the same level. Because any tree that grows taller than another tree then gets battered a lot more by the wind and it doesn't grow as well because the wind is damaging it. So if you look over here to the, to the, to the left, you can see those trees are a lot higher up on the, um, on the sand dune and even though they're high up in the sand dunes, the tops of the trees aren't any higher than the tops of the trees where I am. The trees are just a lot shorter. And that's because, as I say, these ones that are lower down are much more protected and much more sheltered so they can grow taller and the wind doesn't damage them as much. Also, the ones up there, there's going to have a lot less moisture in the soil. Their roots are going to have to go three or four meters deep just to get to the level of these roots and then maybe even another two or three meters below that to get some really good moisture levels and nutrients levels. Whereas these trees, they only have to put their roots down a few meters, maybe even just one meter, and they can get into the groundwater where there's plenty of moisture and there's gonna be a lot of nutrients which have been leached out of the sands and might have even come from some hills and uh, farmers fields from further afield and to get the extra nutrients. So there we are, these are some lovely big trees. As I say, the further back I go into inland and the deeper the valley, the taller the trees because they're nicely sheltered, they've got more moisture and they've got more nutrients as well. So where I am now is the very highest point pretty much where the original sand dunes were. So just, th just about um, the 1930s, as I say, about 80 years ago, this was actually part of the sand dunes and these were, would have been really big sand dunes with actually not much mound grass. This area used to be quite bad which is constant shifting sand. You can see there's still, even though we're two or three hundred meters away from the sea, there's still a few amount of grass plants still surviving here, despite this being not a, a, a sand dune environment for many years, and it's now a forest environment. So I'll take you down here. You'll be able to see the height that we are, as I say, two or three hundred meters away from the sea, but we're probably about 20 or 30 meters in height. So this is, I say, about 20 or 30 meters high. And you can see right down there, the land really drops away and then it drops down another 20 meters when it, or probably another 10 meters when it gets to the sea. So you can really see how big these sand dunes were originally. And even though where we are now is a nice sheltered forest environment, you can still see, as I say, you've got the mound grass still here. You've still got the sand and it's just, there's no soil, it's just sand. You're slowly getting there, slowly getting more organic matter, but it's still sand even this far back. So as you can see, it's still, it takes many, many decades for it to finally become soil and it's still a sandy environment. And as we go further back, what you'll find is it's quite sheltered from the wind because here, because the, this, the sand dune here is so high, anything further back is sheltered from the westerlies because the winds here nearly always come from the west and the west is behind me. So as we go further back, the trees will get even larger again as they're more sheltered from the wind and there'll be some other plants because we'll come to some clearings where the forest has been deforested. So we're now several hundred meters back from the sea and where we are is an old railway cutting so it's probably about 15 meters below the, the surrounding soil level. Uh, this was an old railway used for Burghead and Hopeman, the two villages nearby and in the 1960s it was stopped so there hasn't been tra trains here for years but as you can still see we've got the old railway tracks. So here is a much much richer environment than anywhere else we've been so far. 
partly because we're so much further back from the sea, but also because we were in a cutting here, so a lot of wind has blown a lot of the leaves further down here and pine needles. Also, it's because it's lower down, there's a lot more moisture in the soil and it's a much richer environment. So we've got plants like here, like the heather, the heath, heathland plants. These are well suited because they do well in environments where it's quite, um, quite exposed. There's a lot of sun here. It's not actually windy, but um, the soil is still not the greatest, but the heather can survive here. We've also got some nice lichens. If I show you right down here, some quite big ones with um, large, large leaves. You can see there's a lovely one there and you can even see some little rooting structures on the base and even possibly some uh, fruiting structures there. They're, they're really good for moist, damp conditions, this one. As there's no roots, you can. I'm just going to pop this back in where it came from. So yeah, it's a very sheltered environment here and the soil is much better. Um, I'll show the soil in a second. So some of the plants here, uh, there's a lot of different ones that have self-seeded. I'm not entirely sure where the seeds have come from because originally there wouldn't have been much here apart from the coarse pine which was planted. But we've got a nice western hemlock up here. It's really doing well. It's a very healthy example of a, a western hemlock. So this is for a native to America, the western hemlock. You can see it's, it's much more like a fir than a... Um, in a pine, you can see it's got nice small needles. And this one's a really healthy one. It's probably growing, well, I don't know, possibly two meters plus every year. It could be over two meters of growth this is putting on every year. I can see some of the other coarse pines in this area are putting on about a meter of growth because the soil here is so much richer. It's really sheltered. And even though it's sheltered, we've got this, this now midday, you've got the midday sun stays on this area the whole day. So it gets really good sunlight. It doesn't get the sun in the morning and the evening, but it gets the midday sun, so it gets really good, uh, strong light levels. Which is why you've got this really tall, health western hemlock. As you saw how windy it was at the shore, it's quite a breezy day today, but there's barely a breath of wind here, because it's so sheltered. So I could, should expect this tree to get to the height of these other trees in probably only about 10, 15 years time, because it's doing so well. So there's other plants here as well. I'm just, just being careful not to kill any of them. You've got several Corsican pines starting to seed up. That's just because there's so many Corsican pines in this area. And if you look to the left over there, you can see there's loads of Corsican pines which have self-seeded themselves from the older pines up around me. But further along here, there's a, there's a Norway spruce. So again, I'm not sure how this has got here, but there's Norway spruce has managed to find itself here. You can see this one is struggling quite a bit. I don't think it's struggling because of, of the soil around here. I think just because it's quite on an exposed section here. If this was growing further back where the other ones were, maybe it would be doing better. Or maybe it's just not as well suited as the pines in the Western Hemlock to this environment. Each plant is best suited to different parts of the world, which is why they're all slightly different so they can grow in different areas. Otherwise, everywhere would just be covered with the same plant. So here we are, you can see it's lost a lot of its needles, it's not doing too well. It's only put on a few centimetres of growth, but the Norway spruce is growing. Um, it probably won't do well, it may not even survive, but that's just so that there's another, there's, there's getting more variety of plants now, more species. And back here, right behind me, you can see this very tall, thin pine tree. That's a Scots pine, that's a native pine around here. So that's probably blown in from some nearby native trees. They could have, they might, they might have been one or two Scots pines actually growing in the area before they planted the Corsican pines. And you can see that one there is doing really well. Anything that's on the lower part here, like that one up there, has been self-seeded, hasn't been planted, and it, is, it can't be more than really 40 years old because that was about 40 years ago that this railway line became out of use. So yeah, it's looking really good in this area. Lots of more plants. You can see the reason why. There's a lot of sand here, but the sand is actually a lot more like soil now. It doesn't look really like pure sand like it would from a beach. So you can see it's no longer yellow in colour. It's quite dark. And that's because there's a really good mixture of organic matter really mixed in throughout. So it's quite a dark colour. And this is more of a sandy soil now. So instead of just being pure sand, we're starting to get something that looks more like soil, like a very sandy soil. Still, you could revert back to dunes if you weren't careful. And I'm sure if I go down more than a few centimetres, probably down about 20, 30 centimetres, it'll just be pure sand again. But certainly the top layer of the soil is getting quite rich. And finally, I'll show you down here that there's a lot of, there's still a lot of lichens here. And so there's still, there's still fairly poor soil in, in certain patches. But generally, as I say, it's a lot richer here and that's why there's much better species selection in this part of the, the woodland. 
So because there's such a deep cutting, the moisture level in the soil here is a lot higher and the water table is much higher than it is elsewhere in the sand dunes. So we've got some other plants which are, you wouldn't expect to find in the sand dune location. So what we have here is a young willow tree. You can see it's quite healthy. It's done quite well. It's a very young one. It's probably only about three or four years old. But because it's so moist in, the, in this area, you can see, see with all the moss around here that it's quite moist. And this is very damp sand, even though it is sand. So this will probably do very well. It might struggle a bit for the first couple of years until it gets to the water table. But being a deep cutting, the water table probably isn't that far. And this will really take off once it does get that water. And the other tree right next to it here is the silver birch. Silver birch is a very good example of a pioneer tree. They do very well in areas that are quite exposed and they have very small seeds so the seeds can blow for tens of meters maybe even if there's a very strong storm could set, cover several miles in, in, in one day in, in a few days just blowing around. So that's the um, silver birch. We'll probably find some larger trees further back where there's some more open areas but because it's sunny here and there's some bare soil as soon as the seed landed it's going to do really well. This will very quickly grow into a tall tree. Silver birch as I say is one of the best examples of a pioneer tree. You'll find it Anywhere in the northern hemisphere that's far north, so a lot of um, parts of Alaska, they have a lot of silver birches, different types of silver birches, also Canada, parts of Russia, and here in North Scotland as well, we get a lot of silver birch naturally growing around in our area. And part of the reason it doesn't grow further south is it doesn't like the hot summers, it gets a lot of fungal diseases on the leaves, doesn't do well in hot weather, and also it needs a cold period for the seeds to germinate. It's quite specific with the silver birch. The seeds actually need to be underneath snow because they need to have a constant temperature of just around freezing. So melting snow is really what helps these to germinate. You can probably germinate them without melting snow, but if the seeds are underneath melting slow, snow so that seeds have a long period where the temperature is always just about zero, which is the dividing line between ice and water as it melts, that you get much better germination, which is another reason why these do a lot better in these northern climes where we get a lot more snow. So what I'm standing next to here is another Corsican pine and I've stopped along this tree just to show you the sheer size of it. You can see it's an absolutely massive tree. It's done really well. This is further back again so the soil is much better. You can maybe see in this environment it's a lot flatter so this part of the sand dunes um, this, the soil is much better for the plants. It probably wasn't a pure sand dune when it was first planted. It was probably already scrub land that was already partly settled so there's probably more organic matter in this soil here. Also, it's not surrounded by other trees, which has given it a lot more space to grow its branches. So even though it's not a huge amount taller than the other trees, it is a huge amount. It's a lot thicker. There's a lot more branches, a lot more girth from the tree, and it's doing really well in this situation back here. So this is now a good example of a mature silver birch. You can actually see on the stem it's silver. That's kind of a white color, so that's why it's called the silver birch. This one here is a nice large size. It's quite a mature one. It's probably only about 15... 20, maybe 30 at the most years old, it's a very fast growing tree. It doesn't grow a huge amount taller than this, maybe twice the height if it's in a good location. But as I say, it's a pioneer tree, so it has a very fast life cycle. It goes from seed to fruiting in just a few years. And it doesn't get as big as a lot of the other trees, but it's very well suited to a pioneer area that hasn't been settled yet and has poor soils. So the reason we're now getting broadleaf trees is because the soil is a lot better. With the pine trees and that, they've got very small needles and have a very, very waxy coating on them. That really protects them against any other drought conditions and the salt spray. Whereas this can't really handle any drought and it can't handle any salt spray. So the reason that we've got broad-leaved trees here is, is because of that. It's a lot more sheltered and it really shows that we're now in an area which is doing much better when it comes to the environment being a lot more hospitable to different plants. And in fact, as I walk over here, there's actually a sycamore tree. The Latin name for the sycamore is Asa pseudoplatinus. It's a very common tree throughout the UK. It's not native. Um, I've got several leaves down here. You can see one there. As this rots down, it's going to provide a really good leaf mold, a lot better than what the pine needles do. And that will further enhance what's happening here with the soil becoming more like soil and less like sand. So it's kind of hard to see from the camera, but um, it's this one up here with the bare branches. That's the sycamore tree. As I say, it's actually originally from the Swiss Alps and the other parts of the Alpine regions uh, in Europe. But it's, uh, invasive, it's partly an invasive species because it spreads so well in the UK, but because it's so closely related, because it's so close in proximity to the UK, I wouldn't really see it as a major alien species. It's, it's almost like a native species now, especially as it's been here for hundreds of years. So that's it growing up there doing quite well. And that's, it has got big leaves so it can't survive any areas which are really too too extreme. So that's another good example that we're getting to an area which is much more hospitable for plants and this is much more like normal soil now and less like sand. 
So here we are next to a wood ant nest. This is a good example that the area that we are now in is really getting quite rich in biodiversity. The wood ants, they have to have enough insects and enough plants that they can feed on to survive. So <clears throat> the fact that we've got this here shows that we're definitely in a good ecosystem now with several different plant species and um, animal species. So you can see it's quite big. I put my hand on it, you can see the size of it. Now the wood ants are actually quite rare in Scotland. You only get them in a few forests, but where you do get them, they are doing really well and you get hundreds of them, thousands. If I was here in summer, I wouldn't be able to get this close because I'd be crawling with ants right now. This is almost, in summer, this is almost like constantly shifting around. It's almost like mesmerizing, seeing all the thousands upon thousands of ants just walking around. But we do actually have one ant here and um, there's just one or two around and I'll try and show you a nice close up of what they look like. And as I say, the, here they're very common in this woodland, especially further west in Colburn Sands. Colburn Sands and parts of the Highlands have a really good population of the wood ants up there. So here we are, we've got the wood ant there. You can see he's getting a little bit agitated as he sees the camera. And if you look, every now and again, he'll put his abdomen underneath his um, body. And that's what happens is, is his defense mechanism. And he'll actually spray formic acid pretty much in your face. So it's a bit like vinegar. He'll just spray like a vinegar spray of acid at any intruder. What that'll do, is it'll mean that they get warned off because it'll be painful for them and they'll leave the ants alone. So that's the wood ant. If I just put my finger near it again, you might see it trying to spray. You can see it rearing up there and it'll probably try and bite my finger. It's got very big jaws, quite a strong thing. And as it bites my finger, it'll then spray acid. So it makes the wound and then the acid goes in the wound and damn it, and then um, it's obviously a lot more painful. So it's very sleepy at the moment. If this was summer, he'd be going really fast. You can see him climbing on there. Doesn't seem to be too bothered by my presence. But um, that's the wood ant, a very important species for the woodland. And I'm just gonna put him back now before he, he starts biting my finger. So where I'm standing now is a part of the forest which has been recently deforested, probably about three or four years ago, maybe as long as five years ago. So what the reason for it is the, the power lines behind us, they've had to clear it away for the power lines. So it's a very open environment. To put, trees have been removed. As you can see around me, there's lots of tree trunks and uh, stumps and things like that, bits of old wood from the trees, but the actual trees have been removed. What's that allowed is a lot of bare ground. As you saw in the other parts of the forest, it would have just been pure pine needles here. Not many other plants really growing underneath the trees, but because the, the um, trees are now gone, there's a lot more daylight coming in. The pine needles have also rotted away, so they're not ca causing an impenetrable barrier to the plants. So we've got a lot of, of uh, shrubs growing here. So this is broom. The broom is a very good pioneer species again. It survives very well in open areas, can take a lot of wind, and this will probably get quite a lot of wind in this area when there's a storm because it's quite open. It also needs a lot of sunshine, and it does really well because it can fix nitrogen, very much like the sea buckthorn can fix nitrogen. So this is a legume, and any of the most of the legumes can fix nitrogen. This has lovely yellow flowers in spring. It's quite a nice garden plant. A lot of you might see it in your garden. Um, so this has done well here. It's completely covered the area. It does it very well anywhere that there's bare soil. Even if there was only one or two of these here in the environment when it first was deforested, this can grow up, start setting seed in the third year. The seeds, they actually explode from the seed pods. So the seed pods, as they dry out, they twist. And as they twist, they do it very violently and they, they throw the seeds several meters in either direction so they can quickly spread. Wherever there's bare ground, then they'll quickly germinate. And then again, they can grow in about three years time. So that's why this area has been covered very quickly. And these are doing a great job of putting nitrogen back into the soil. And that nitrogen, then, nitrogen will then enrich it further and allow more trees to grow up again. And there's a lot of trees further in here starting to grow. So the trees are much slower growing. They're much more of a climax community. So they, they grow slowly and they're the final community that will probably grow in this habitat. These are a pioneer species, the, the broom. So they grow a lot faster and that's why these are a lot taller than any of the trees. But there'll be hundreds of seedlings around here. And they can show you just down here, we've already got some silver birch growing up. We've got some wild roses as well. We've got lots of Corsican pine seedlings coming up around the old trunks. So these will grow up above the broom soon. And because the broom can't handle any shade, they'll be very quickly killed off by the trees. As soon as the trees and the other plants grow above the broom, the broom will die off and this will become a nice forest again. But the broom will have done the hard work. It will have got all the nitrogen out, a lot of the nitrogen out of the air, put it into the soil, and that'll help enrich the, the trees. And as these die down, they'll further enrich the trees. But this area is actually surprisingly rich. The, uh, the top probably 10 centimeters here is really nice composty soil here. And this is, will look identical to pretty much any compost you buy from a garden center because this is actually peat that's forming. 
So it's only been probably 80 years or so that this has been a forest, but because it's so much damper here and we're further away from the sea, it's produced a nice layer of peat. And you can see that is exactly the same kind of stuff you'll buy from a garden center. And in fact, this is just on top of the soil at the moment, but if some organisms get in here, if the, if the pH level rises a bit, because at the moment it's very acidic and that's why it's formed the peat, if the acidity reduces and it becomes more alkaline, worms and stuff will start, start feeding in this. And when they start mixing the soil, they'll get the sand and the peat to mix together and it will actually form a very rich soil. So if you actually plowed this area, dug it in at the moment, you'd probably get a really rich soil and it would grow well. But with it being the peat and then sand separation, there's not going to be a lot growing. This is why the pioneer trees are doing, the pioneer plants such as the broom are doing so well. Once this is mixed together, they'll do well because Peat on its own is not good, sand on its own is not good, but a good mix of the two, it'll grow really well. So there you are, pure peat, lovely, lovely stuff. And hopefully in a few years when that gets mixed in and the pH changes because there's a lot less acidity in the soil, this will become quite a, a well-established woodland and it'll be much more like normal garden soil and no longer like the sand dunes that it originally was.